Okay, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, first seminar of the I'm uh, Artificial Intelligence and Mathematics series to 2023. Today we are more than honored to have with us uh, Andrea Montanari. Andrea Montanari is the Robert and Barbara Kleist Professor in the School of Engineering and a Professor of Statistics uh, and by courtesy Mathematics at Stanford University. He received a, a laureate degree in physics in 1997 and a PhD in physics in 2021, both for, uh, from Na Scuola Na Na Normale Superiore in Pisa. He has been a postdoctoral fellow at the Laboratoire de Physique Théorique de l'École de Normale Supérieure uh, in Paris, France, and the Mathematical Science uh, Research, Research Institute of Berkeley in the USA. From two, 2002 to 2010, he was chargé de recherche uh, with Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique uh, CNRS uh, at the uh, LPT EN, ENS. He was awarded the CNR, CNRS Bronze Medal for Theoretical Physics in 2006, the National Science Foundation Career Award in 2008, uh, the Okawa Foundation Research Grant in 2013, the James uh, L. Massey Award on, of the Information Theory Society in 2016, and the Lecamp Prize of the French Statistical Society in 2020. He received the ACM Sigmetric Best Paper Award in 2008 and the Applied Probability Society Best Publication Award in 2015. He was elevated to IEEE uh, Fellow in 2017 and IMS Fellow in 2020. He was an invited sectional speaker at the 2020 International Congress of Mathematicians and an IMS Medallion Lecture for the 2020 Bernoulli IMS World Congress. So it's uh, with extreme pleasure that we leave the floor to Andrea for his uh, presentation. Okay, <clears throat> thanks for the invitation. I, I guess I can start. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so what I'm gonna talk about is uh, a work that I've been doing in my group over the last few years kind of trying to give an overview and, and motivations. And so this was joint work with Berus Gorbani, Song Mei, Theodor Misiakiewicz, who was, were all students of mine, and each other, Zhang, was a postdoc in my group. Uh, so let me start with, the, with, the, with an appetizer. This is going to be a very simple example. And uh, yeah, so say that we have a signal uh, or a function that we want to represent or, or learn. And in this case, this will be a function over the interval zero to pi. And uh, we sample it at random times, uh, t1 to tn. So these are uniformly random times in the interval zero to pi. And uh, <clears throat> we want to reconstruct the original signal from these samples. Uh, one very natural way to do it is, is uh, with, okay, what I'm calling here harmonic regression. Uh, that is, we represent the function as uh, a series of uh, uh, sine and cosines, so a harmonic series. And then we can fit the coefficient by basically linear regression. So we minimizing the uh, sum of squares, so the residual sum of squares, sum over i, 1 to n, y i minus uh, f of t i. And uh, since we have an infinite series here, we need to add some penalty to regularize for smoothness, to you know, induce smoothness. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna do it here by uh, taking a weighted delta norm, so W one half theta square, where W, uh, I'll take it basically the frequency square. This is basically a Sobolev norm of, of the function F, okay? So basically I fit the polynomial and I fit a trigonometric polynomial and I discard or I penalize high frequency coefficients, you know, large L coefficients. Okay. So let's do this experiment of fitting this polynomial and uh, uh, I'll do it with lambda very small in such a way that, uh, so lambda very small will mean that I penalize uh, very little my coefficient and I achieve therefore zero interpolation. I, I kind of put most of the weight of on the residual sum of square terms. Okay, 
And here is the experiment and uh, the green, green curve is what I obtained by fitting this, this uh, method, by using this method to fit the data points. And I obtained you know, a very good reconstruction of my original, my original um, function, my original signal, okay? Now let's repeat the same experiment by add, adding noise. So I add, you know, here Gaussian noise to the data, uh, and therefore they don't fall anymore on the original curve. And I fit exactly the same method. I use exactly the same method to fit the curve to this point. And what you obtain is again that since lambda the regularization is very small, I will interpolate the the data points. So I will go uh, through the data points. But uh, now what I get is that the green curve, the fitted curve, is not as good uh, as before. It's far from, from the original, right? And what's worse about it is that uh, you know, if I increase the number of, of data points, so the number of, of red points here, the, the interpolating curve doesn't approximate better and better the original you know, blue signal. Uh, it actually stays... I, you know, far from the blue signal and doesn't improve with sample size. Okay, so this is uh, something that uh, you you probably have seen. You know, I I stay close to the data point and therefore you know in presence of noise I will not follow the signal. We can look at it also from the Fourier viewpoint. So here in the bottom frames, what I I reported are. Uh, the Fourier spectrum of the original functions of the blue function, so the absolute value of the Fourier coefficients, and the Fourier spectrum of the reconstructed signal, so the, the fitted theta L, the coefficients of this trigonometric series. And what you see is that uh, you know, as the sample size increases, you don't stick close to the blue curve, but at a certain point you hit a floor and the floor corresponds to the fact that there is high frequency, there is noise, there is flat noise, white noise in my data, and therefore you, uh, you, fit, you hit the white noise floor. Okay, so this is, this is something that is, that is kind of, uh, you know, should be uh, familiar to everyone. And, uh, you know, one can convince himself or herself that... Uh, that uh, it's not an accident that the error doesn't vanish as the sample size goes to infinity in this example. And uh, the proof or the reasoning uh, is the following. Uh, first of all, the function that I reconstruct by my penalization will be smooth mm, since I penalize high frequency coefficient. And near the training point will be off by factor two, where two is the standard deviation of the noise. So it will be off the the, the truth, the ground truth by a factor two. <clears throat> and, uh, and therefore, you know, at the sample points, at the training points, you will be away from the truth. But since you are smooth, you'll be away from the truth also in a neighborhood of the training points. <clears throat> and the neighborhood of the training points, of course, will cover a positive fraction of the interval zero to pi of, of the interval of the function, okay? So again, what happens is that you are off the original curve by the standard deviation of the noise at the training point. And since the curve is smooth, it will be off also in the small neighborhood of that. And the union of these small neighborhoods cover a positive fraction of the interval zero to pi. <clears throat> so this, this three points argument convinces you uh, and actually uh, can be made of a proof into a proof that the error doesn't vanish as sample size goes to infinity in this, uh, you know, if I use near interpolator or an interpolator. And actually this was made, this argument was made you know, rigorous and precise in the case of kernel ridge regression in the paper of Racklin and Jai in <coughs> 2019. Now, why, why I'm, okay, so this is again, you know, the same experiment in which I, I check this fact I, I report the mean square error, the reconstruction error in the case of, for this, this precise toy experiment in the case of noisy and noiseless data. And you see that for noiseless data, you know, the error goes to zero as n goes to infinity. 
horizon go grows and in the case of noisy data it stays constant okay so i, I I'm, I'm saying here something uh you know that should be again familiar to everyone interpolating noisy data is not a good idea uh, uh and the reason why i'm going over this is that uh, you know one one discovery that i want to emphasize in this in this presentation is that uh, if you go in high dimension for high dimensional learning or you know, fitting functions in high dimensions, uh, the story is different. And here, high dimension will mean that the sample size is a polynomial with you know, fractional power alpha, so alpha is between zero and infinity, of the uh, base dimension. Mm -hmm. So the, the example that I just described was dimension equal one. But uh, you know, my story would be that for large sample size, for, for large dimension, the story is different. Okay, so, so I've, uh, here is, is the outline of the talk. Uh, I have, uh, you know, basically I will go over these uh, fundamentals, that is uh, models and motivations for what I'll talk about, and then uh, describe the linear regime of neural network and describe generalization of uh, properties of kernel ridge regression and uh, yeah i guess I'll, I'll stop there and uh uh yeah for for the discussion i have some more advanced uh, slides on more advanced topics that is uh, neural tangent models uh, and random feature models but i guess you get the gist of what i'm seeing from the first three points okay models <clears throat> Okay, so 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 here to to uh, you know introduce notations. Here uh, I'll look at supervised learning. So it's it's basically the same problem that I was describing before. We have data y i x i s, and the x i s are are feature vectors or covariates. So for instance, an image could be an example of a good x i, and y i s are labels <coughs> or response variables. For instance, whether this image is is a cat or a dog. Okay, and of course, the name of the game is that we want to predict a new label. So we want to come up with a model that is a function from RD to R that uh, minimize uh, the uh, error or, on a new data point. So minimize some sort of distance between the new data points and the prediction for an unseen data point that is distributed as the training data, Y new, X new. And okay, throughout this talk, I will stick to the simplest possible case that is square loss. Okay, so so uh, you know, throughout the talk, I work I work within this standard model for 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 you know this problem, in which the data y i x i are i i d from a common distribution p, so p is a distribution in r times r d, uh, and therefore you know what I'm interested in is uh, the expected uh, uh, error on a new data point from the same distribution p, and and the example, of course, that we have in mind, and you know, we will not really tackle in this talk, but uh, the example that we want to try to understand is the case of multilayer neural network. So this is an example. You know, a multilayer neural network is just a parameterized function class in which you take, you know, composition of uh, matrix vector multiplication, where the matrices are, you know, weight matrices W1, W2, WL, and uh, composition with, you know, some nonlinear activation sigmas. Okay, so again, W acts on vectors by uh, multiplication, and sigma acts on vectors by uh, entry-wise application of nonlinear function. Here are two standard examples of such nonlinear function. Okay. And, and uh, you know, okay, so I mentioned before that, that uh, uh, you know, it's a not a good idea to interpolate in low dimension. And here is, is what instead uh, is uh, the experiment that was at the origin a little bit of this line of work or the sequence of experiments that was were at the origin of this line of work. This is one specific experiment from from Natis Rebro's group. And uh, what they did here is that they took two small data sets, MNIST and CIFAR 10, and they fitted two layers neural network with increasing width. 
Okay, so H is the number of, on the x-axis, H is the number of hidden nodes in the neural network. And what they plot is, uh, they plot as a function of uh, the width. So the width is basically, the width times the input dimension is basically the number of parameters. So the width is a proxy for the number of parameters of the network. As a function of the number of hidden units, they plot the training error and the test error. And, uh, and what they observe is, is quite striking. The training error as expected decreases, right? More and more parameters you're able to fit more and more better and better the data. And at a certain point it hits zero. Basically it hits zero roughly at the point at which you have as many parameters as data points. And this makes perfect sense. At that point you have, you know, interpolation means that you have one equation for each data point. And so you mean you have as many equations as parameters. Uh, but what they observe also is this uh, striking phenomenon in which the test error keep decreasing, okay? And uh, actually the optimal test error is in the regime where H is bigger than, okay, in the left figure bigger than 128 and the right figure bigger than 512. So it's in the regime in which uh, the train error is zero, okay? So the optimal things to do in this case is to interpolate. Right? So these are the summary of this, this experiment. You know, the function class in which you operate, you should operate is rich enough to interpolate the data points. In this regime, the test error is much bigger than the train error. And despite this, the test error is okay. Right? So this is, uh, you know, really in striking contrast with the, uh, you know, little experiment and with whatever we teach to you know, students that is you shouldn't interpolate the data because this leads to overfitting this is overfitting and leads to poor generalization property in this case you interpolate the data and uh, you are doing fine and the second point is in stark contrast with what we expect from statistical learning theory statistical learning theory you know, BC theory, et cetera, teaches up typically that generalization, good generalization occurs or good test error occurs when test error and train error are, are close together. Your test error is much bigger than train error and still things are just fine. Okay, so this is a similar experiment uh, that was done um, at the same time by Zhang uh, et al. At Google, here they took uh, you know a few standard uh, uh, neural networks. On the middle uh, frame, you see Inception, AlexNet, and then a, a multi-layer perceptron. And they took uh, 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 you know again a small data set, CIFAR10, and then they did something interesting. That is, they, they replaced the true labels YI. This where there are images in three, 10 classes. So you they replace the true label images by noise, by random label. So these are cats, dogs, cars, etc. So they reshuffle it for a, a percentage of, of the data. So this is the middle, in the middle plot, there is the, on the X axis, the label corruption. And so what you see in the left plot, for instance, is that despite random labels through curve, the, the loss goes to zero uh, as you train the model. So uh, as a function of, so it takes longer in SGD step to get to zero, but it's, eventually you get to zero. So you can optimize the model and get to zero error despite the model is pure noise. And, uh, and so the, the, the model is again, rich enough to fit pure noise, but what is, uh, so, you know, it shouldn't generalize so well, but impressively, if you look at the plot as a function of label corruption, this degrades uh, gracefully, in particular, if you look at uh, the right-hand plots in which you'd see test error as a function of label corruption, this increases linearly uh, with the label corruption. And what does this mean? It means that you know, you are doing perhaps poorly on the on the random labels, 
but you are doing okay on the true labels. So despite you interpolate the you know, noisy, the completely noisy label, this doesn't hurt you in the generalization properties. Okay, so this is uh, something that we set to try to understand. I remember when I first saw these experiments, I was kind of shocked and, and I thought this was, uh, you know, borderline unbelievable and uh, and uh, but now you know at least uh, this linear regime allows us to understand this in a pretty uh, simple way and even if it is not a whole story i think it's an interesting uh, you know clarified things uh, so what is the linear regime uh, so let me give you the the <coughs> the uh, kind of gist of it uh, so we are in an overparameterized model. So here, what I'm depicting in the cartoon is the you know, space of parameters of the neural network, RP. So P is the number of parameters, and this is, uh, <coughs> you know, in the overparameterized regime, this is a highly over uh, under constrained problem. The problem of you want to fit the data such that you get test error equal zero. So this is this R H at n theta equal zero. And this is an under-constrained problem. So there are lots of solutions. So this blue curve is kind of my cartoon of the manif manifold of global empirical risk minimizers. That is the manifold of models that have risk zero. So, you know, this space contains many, um, you know, a priori equivalent empirical risk minimizer that achieve empirical risk equal to zero. And, uh, and the intuition is that if you start at a random point where in this space, as you do when you start with the SGD, so when you do SGD, you initialize weights randomly, you converge quickly to the closest point in some sense on this manifold. So this is the intuition of why we see this uh, train error going to zero. And so you, you are able to optimize globally this highly non-convex function. Uh, so somehow here the, the, the punchline is that over parametrization emerges in this model or is convenient in these models because it leads to tractability. That is, it makes a, a problem that is a priori non-convex easy to, to, to solve, okay? So this can be made rigorous in a certain regime, the neural tangent regime. And, uh, and what is the neural tangent regime is the regime in which you can approximate the, the neural network or the model by a linear, linearly parameterized model, right? So to explain it, let me take the case of two layers neural networks. Uh, okay, I'll take two layers neural network with you know, second layer weights all equal to plus alpha minus alpha. I initialize the first layer weights at random, so uniform on the sphere, and so that at initialization, the function is exactly zero. So the first half cancel the second half of the network. Here, capital N is the number of neurons. And then what I'll do is I linearize uh, around this function around the initialization. So if my intuition is correct, my, my training points don't, my, my parameters don't move much from the initialization. So I linearize. And as you see, okay, this is, should be alpha times F. If I rescale the function by constant alpha to leading order, what I get is the gradient to respect to the parameters of f times uh, a coefficient vector f. And in the case of two layers neural network, this linearized function has this uh, peculiar form is the sum over the neuron of bj times x times sigma prime of theta zero times x. All right? And this kind of way of studying really neural network was introduced in a paper by Jaco Gabriel Ongler in 2018. Okay, so what is what is the picture here is that somehow, you know, I, I, I'm trying to minimize this risk, that is y minus the evaluation of f at the data points. And, uh, you know, if I linearize around the initialization, you can replace f by the Jacobian of f times b, that is the difference between the parameters and the initialization. And you know, around 2018-19, a sequence of paper proved that in certain regime, this is actually the case that you can really approximate this risk by the linearized risk. 
Okay. If you if you believe that, then then you know the model becomes a linear model. That is, it becomes uh, the following: you you take the data x, you pass them through a featureization map phi, and then you multiply it by uh, a vector of parameters b. Okay. And uh, you know the model will be therefore nonlinear in the input, so phi of x nonlinear. But will be parameterized by, you know, linearly parameterized, parameterized by B. Okay? And the futurization map that is relevant for two layers network is the following: is you take, you know, the n unit, you multiply x by the first layer weights that are random. So these are the layer, the weights at initialization. You take sigma prime of that, and you take that coefficient times x, and you stick together a capital N of this. Okay, and what are you interested in within this linear model? We are interested in you know, whatever gradient descent uh, converges to, and gradient descent should converge to, uh, you know, in a linear model, is an easy exercise that if you do minimize by gradient descent a square error, uh, you reach the point of uh, you know, the minimizer that has minimum L2 norm. So you are interested really the, to the minimum L2 norm interpolator uh, with this featureization map. <laughs> okay, so, so sum summarizing, okay, perhaps I have it here. Uh, summarizing, we started by trying to understand this phenomenon, that is the phenomenon that, you know, the, you, you, the training error, there is a regime in which the training error is much smaller than the test error. You are actually interpolating the data. And uh, despite this, uh, the test error is you know, small, is optimal, actually. And uh, we, we reach the conclusion in which to understand this, we have, or you know, as a certain regime to understand this, we have to understand this uh, minimum L2 norm interpolator, that is, uh, you know, this following model, I take the data x in high dimension, I featureize them through this uh, nonlinear random map, and then I look at the coefficients of parameters that is the minimum L2 norm interpolator of this data. <laughs> and okay, there is a natural generalization of this method that is, of course, instead of doing the minimum L2 norm, I do uh, ridge regression. In in which I minimize the sum of squares plus a penalty term lambda b square. And uh, the minimum norm interpolator is, of course, recovered if I let lambda go to zero. And here, what we are interested in is, of course, characterize the test error. So I see a new data point. And then for this model, that is b hat times phi, I, I compute the distance from f star. Okay, so now I'm gonna state um, some uh, theorem, and this is uh, actually the, no, I don't know, the only theorem probably I'll, I'll state in this part. Uh, and uh, okay, the theorem can be stated under more general assumptions, actually kind of abstract assumptions, but uh, I'll make it concrete and I'll take the simplest possible example. So I'll assume the Xi to be, uh, random and uniform on the sphere uh, in the dimension. And uh, you know, for normalization, it's convenient to take the sphere of radius of square root of d, so that each vent is of the vector axis of uh, norm of order one. You can get similar result if xi are normal zero identity. <laughs> and yi to be related to the xi according to a target function f star, so f star xi plus epsilon i, so f star is the true function. And here I basically make no assumption of f star, just that is a square integrable function. And this of course is needed because otherwise uh, it doesn't even make sense to talk about L2 uh, error. And again, assume sigma very general, just weakly differentiable with, with polynomial growth of the derivative. And okay, the only two, two important thing is that, okay, so these are, uh, the first one is just for convenience. Assume that sigma is non-zero projection on all the Hermit polynomials. So here k 
is AK is the, the Hermit polynomial of degree K, and uh, G is a standard normal. So this is just a non-degeneracy assumption to avoid, uh, you know, you know, things can be stated more generally, but to simplify things. And then the, the number of, of sample points, okay, here there is a mistake, is bigger than d to the epsilon or some epsilon. Okay, so, so the, 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 the strategy to analyze this, this model, this two layer network is start from, or the strategy that we to, to is start from the infinite width limit and then, so this is number of neurons equal infinity and then control the difference between n finite and n infinity. And again, I will have time of only to go over the first point uh, <clears throat> in the next few minutes. Right, so what does it mean infinite width limit? I'm letting the, the width of this network go into infinity and the sample size to be polynomially related to the dimension. So n equal d to the alpha or, or log n over log d to be of order one. Okay, so how do we take the large uh, width limit? Uh, the, the convenient, one convenient way to think about it is to reformulate this uh, regression problem that I, I just copied from the previous page, pages above. So this is minimizing the residual sum of square with respect to this linear model plus the L2 norm of B square. I want to rewrite it uh, in function space. Uh, so what does it mean in function space? I rewrite B times phi as a function F and this norm, the L2 norm of B, induces a certain Hilbert norm on F. And this Hilbert norm is just the RKHS norm uh, with uh, kernel, uh, so reproducing kernel Hilbert space norm with kernel that is uh, just the product of the featureization map. So if you, if you look at this, this is the the product of the featureization map, scalar product of the featureization map evaluated at point x1 and evaluated at point x2, okay? And this takes the form of a sum of the capital N neurons. Okay, now at least formally, once you write it in this way, it's quite natural to guess, easy to guess what is the infinite width limit, then proving it is another business, but at least guessing is, is easy. Uh, you just look at the kernel and notice that the, there is a sum over the capital N neurons. And now you remember that the theta i's are iid with a certain distribution. So these theta i's again are the first layer weights at initialization. They are iid with some distribution. We took uniform you know, on the sphere. And, uh, and therefore by the law of large numbers, just for fixed the x1, x2, Kn will converge to a limit that is just replacing this empirical average over the neuron by the expectation over the, the distribution of theta. Uh, so in the limit, you get again an RK, you would guess that you get again a kernel ridge regression with respect to this limiting infinite width kernel. Okay. And uh, what is the structure of this kernel? Again, since the axes are on the sphere, and the theta again are uniform on the sphere, what happens is that this expectation depends on x1, x2 only through their scalar product and through their norm. And since their norm is fixed, the only non-trivial thing is the scalar product. So this kernel is an inner product kernel. And this fact, this relation of course within, between random feature models and kernel methods is, is not new. Okay, so at least in the infinite width limit, we, we are reduced to studying just the RKHS with respect to an inner product kernel on the sphere, uh, but uh, in the regime in which the dimension is a polynomial of, of the sample size, right? So this is kind of, this RKHS problem is kind of classical, uh, but uh, you know, the relation between the dimension and the sample size is not new, was not investigated before. And we did it a few years ago. So this is a theorem uh, about this, this uh, uh, specific kernel ridge regression problem. It says the following, assume that the dimension, that the sample size is a polynomial of the dimension 
And uh, you know, for this theorem, I'll avoid the integer powers. So it's not d to the L for L and integer, but it's between say d to the L plus epsilon and d to L plus swan minus epsilon for some epsilon positive. Then the following happens for any uh, lambda in some interval zero lambda star where lambda star is a strictly positive constant, the risk of kernel ridge regression is equal to the projection of the target function onto polynomials of degree uh, at least L plus one plus a smaller or term. Okay, further, no inner product kernel method can do better in particular no choice of the regularization parameter bigger than in this interval can do better than this. In fact, even if you choose the loss function, we prove that you cannot do better. So a couple of remarks about this theorem. It's, it's a pointwise theorem, so it holds for any fixed target function. So it just tells you for any target function for F star, the risk is going to be this. And the interpretation of the right-hand side is quite simple. It is saying that you know, when you fit this, this RKHS method, this kernel regression, you will learn what? You will learn the projection of the target onto polynomials of degree less or equal than L. Right? You will learn that part basically perfectly, and you will not learn anything else. Right? You will treat anything that is higher frequency than that as noise. Uh, okay, so this is thing. And where does the relation between D and N comes from? Well, it's kind of intuitive that N should be roughly related to D to the L, because in a polynomial of degree L, you need a D to the L coefficient. So you will need at least sample size to be D to the L to learn all of those coefficients just by counting degrees of freedom. But what is surprising here is that if you have d to the l, you know, for instance, d to the 4.5 uh, samples, you will not learn anything beyond the degree four polynomial. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second, you know, the, or the third fact that is interesting is that here, as you see from this, zero is included in this interval of allowed. Uh, lambdas in particular, okay, this should be interpreted as zero plus, that is minimum norm interpolation. So interpolation is optimal, no inner product kernel can do better, okay? So we see in this example, you know, again, this phenomenon in which optimal regularization is strictly equal to zero. So optimal uh, error is obtained by uh, interpolating the data. Okay. So this is a sketch of, uh, of the behavior of the risk as a function of log n over log d, so the exponent relating the sample size and the dimension, and you see this plateau at corresponds to the projection on the function of higher and higher dimension, and uh, you know some you know the the region in between the step uh, the the points in which log n over log d is an integer. These are not covered by the theorem. I should add that this is valid for any inner product kernel, in particular, uh, you know, even the neural tangent kernel that comes from multilayer networks. <clears throat> yeah, again, you know, I should mention that, you know, uh, again, uh, inner product kernel or, or RKHS has been, have been studied for a long time, but, you know, analyzing them in the case of interpolating model is, is very recent and, Okay, there were a sequence of work that well, were related to ours more or less at the same time. So ours was 2019 and there were, you know, works by Liang Racklin and Jai and, Bart and uh, Bartlett and others at the same time. Okay, so it's a kind of uh, testimonial to the fact that this is a very hot uh, research area. I said before that uh, the point log n over log d integers were not covered by our theorem, <coughs> but in the last year there was progress for those. Okay, for k kappa equal one was done before, but for all the other integer, this was done in a paper by my, my student Theodor Misiakiewicz uh, in April 2022, 
And again, you know, a testimonial to the fact that this is a hot research area is that within a month, there were two other papers obtaining the same result several times. So these papers basically zoom around the integers and exactly precisely characterize the, you know, the behavior of those curves near the integers. And there are some interesting spikes there. Okay, so this, this I think, more or less concludes the fact that, that this part of this talk. Perhaps I should mention something about, uh, you know, how is it possible that lambda equals zero is optimal here? Uh, and uh, the intuition is the following. Uh, what happens in, in high dimension is that um, basically you can create a spike that is a smooth spike around each data point that is very small in L2 sense, so very uh, concentrated, and despite this is smooth, right? If you take it, everything that is in a product bigger than, say, 0 0.9 with a point on the sphere in the dimension, this is as a volume, a cap, that cap on the sphere as a volume that is exponentially small. Right. So the argument that I gave before in low dimension that the neighborhood of the training points covers most of the you know, interval zero to pi doesn't hold in high dimension. If I take a polynomial number of points and I take the spherical caps around this polynomial number of points in high dimension, this still covers uh, a exponentially small subset of the volume. Okay, so this means that when I look at a new training point, this will be very far from all the new test point. This will be very far from uh, all the training points, and um, and therefore and therefore you can interpolate uh, all the training point and stay smooth uh, outside the the region. And uh, another way of seeing that is that if you look at the empirical uh, kernel matrix, the empirical kernel matrix gain a term that is a constant on the diagonal, and this is equivalent basically to a ridge regularization term in your in your uh, kernel ridge regression. Uh, okay, I think I'll I'll, I'll stop I'll stop here and uh, yeah, take questions. Okay, thank you, Andrea, for these enlightening seminars. And also now you leave us with the, uh, the second part, the neural <laughs> tangent regime. We are so curious because, uh, okay, for the moment there are no questions, but I have one question. So, no? uh, you put the, the theorem in the, uh, in the infinite and with, the, but you put it also with the finite and with, with the finite right. and with. The, Right. And uh, the question is, this is connected when you speak about the neural networks so to the depth uh, of the neural networks? Uh, yeah, uh, good question. Good question. Okay, so here, as you said, I, um, I state the theorem for, for, for infinite width. And then, uh, you know, just to, to show it you know, very quickly, you know, we have a theorem for finite width that says basically that the risk in the two is very close to each other. As soon as mm -hmm. the, the, the width of the network, I mean, as soon as the number of parameters that is capital mm -hmm. N times D is bigger than the, the sample size, right? So the error here is, you know, basically the sample size divided mm -hmm. by number of parameters square root, okay? So, so true, uh, you know, so we, we can inherit all the behaviors of the kernel regime to neural network with two layers uh, mm -hmm. if this number, if they are over parameterized. Now, yeah, do we, the, the, the you know, depth, right? So we expect yeah. basically the same to be true, the same kind of theorem to be true uh, for you know, any constant, you know, in multi-layer perceptrons, mm. so fully mm. connected network to be yeah. true for any constant uh, width, uh, for any constant depth. So if you take okay. you know, two hidden layer, three hidden layer, we expect the same theorem to hold. And there probably what will matter is the minimum 
number of not the total number of parameters but the minimum number of parameters in any of the layers so you don't want there to be a uh, bottleneck so if all the layers are of the same width this will be really the number of parameters roughly otherwise will be the smallest number of parameters in any network now unfortunately <laughs> You know, proving such a theorem, um, it's uh, for multi layers is really, uh, you know, fundamentally more difficult. Uh, for more than two layers, it's fundamentally more difficult because, okay, so um, it, it, it's related to something that I mentioned, right? That uh, here, if you look at the relation between the finite width kernel and the infinite width kernel, is uh, relatively simple in the sense that the finite width kernel is a sum of capital N terms and each term is identically distributed. Here you should think of the theta i as random, is identically distributed and so uh, and its expectation is given by the infinite width kernel, right? So it's a sum of IID matrices basically that you're looking at if I look at the of the empirical kernel matrix, this is a sum of IID matrices. Uh, if you look at it, already a kernel with two hidden layers, now these are no longer IID matrices because the two, the two layers are intertwined together. Um, therefore, even simply proving this convergence in, in a good sense, the convergence of KN to K, um, everything except pointwise convergence is difficult. There are some, some results by, I forgot by whom, there are some, some results, but they, they are only applies, you know, on this convergence for, you know, with larger than two, larger than, you know, uh, depth larger than two, there are some results, but they only, uh, they require width uh, much larger than what should be the optimal one. And, and I don't know of any results about generalization really in that case. So, so yeah, the math, I mean, the punchline is that the result should be correct. Yes. We, we are not good enough uh, to prove it. <laughs> so, if you are not good enough, I try to imagine that we, that are uh, common people. No, no, no. no okay, but uh, I understand it's uh, very hard, but uh, this is a very but, but, hot topic. Uh, yeah, topic. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Perhaps the people is uh, uh, is shy or uh, <laughs> wherever is impression by <sighs> your seminar, and uh, I I don't think that uh, there are questions. Nobody is writing. Perhaps they have uh, because we have a lot of people online that okay. follows your seminar. A lot of people, but. Perhaps uh, they have to digest uh, what, <laughs> the news. So, um, Andrea, surely you have, uh, I hope that you will come back to us yeah. to speak about the new tangent regime, uh -huh. the second part, uh -huh. that way we can That's find fine. your papers and your collaborators' papers uh, for uh -huh. the people. There are also some, I invite people also to see a lesson online that are very, very interesting about Andrea Montanari that are on his website website. However, I think that we can uh, stop uh, the seminar here okay. and uh, I will give uh, the next appointment in two weeks uh, with uh, Dario Pasquini and um, okay, so okay. thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Andrea, really <laughs> thanks a lot. And uh, I want just to say that uh, for all the people interested in the subject, Andrea will be in, uh, at, uh, in set on September in Pisa at uh, the Congress, uh, the Italian Congress on Mathematician, Nahumi. So if you are interested, please, please go to Pisa on the first, uh, of the, the first days of September. Thank you to all. A moment, I see perhaps uh, some comments on uh, the people that there is uh, yeah. thanking for the seminar and they have a lot of things on which to reflect. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you bye. and bye to all the people.